Good morning. We're so glad you could join us this morning. We're going to open up in prayer before we get started here. Thank you, Lord. Father, once again, we just give you all the glory and all the honor, Father. We thank you for this opportunity once again to gather in our homes and, and Lord, and here, Lord, just to be in your presence, Father. We know that we are limited, as I said before, Father, but you, Lord, are not. And so I just pray and believe that you're going to meet us where we are. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. Yes. We miss everybody. Yes. But it's time for tithes and offerings. And I hope y'all aren't making faces out there. I hope you're you're happy that the Lord is with us and keeping us, and we're so grateful. So we want to honor him this morning with our tithes and offering. Amen? Amen. I am going to read in Genesis 26, verse 1 through 6, and then I am going to skip down to 12 and 13. Genesis 26, 1 says, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. How about we live in the kingdom of God? Amen. You know, to do that. Verse 3. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Verse 12 and 13. Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, I was reading these scriptures, and it really blessed me because of everything that's going on in the world, you know, we're not really in the famine, but, you know, the economy, the way it is, and people are unemployed, and so a lot of people are running afraid, right? They're afraid that fear comes because we don't know what the future holds. And, you know, in the beginning when all the coronavirus stuff was going, people were going crazy, going to the stores, and it was just uh, overwhelming to see that the, the aisles at the grocery stores were empty, you know? And it seems like our economy was kind of a little bit shaken, but we're not in a physical famine because we still live in a country that, that is prosperous and, and, you know, we have plenty to eat and everything, and there's no reason to run afraid. Amen? Amen. Amen. And the Lord gave Abraham a promise that he was going to bless us, right? And this was really speaking to me because when, when it, all this first started, I started getting emails about getting a loan from, from the government. You know, for businesses, we have a business, and we've been in business 22 years, and the Lord has been with us all this time. And so I kept getting these emails, and this scripture was talking to me because it says that do not go down to Egypt. Egypt was the type of world system. Amen? And we have the promises of Abraham that it says here, and it says that 
and you know that we have his promises so in Galatians it says that if we are in Christ then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise yeah. so these are his promises and it's and then Isaac sowed in that land and the land that I'm looking at is the, the land we live in in the kingdom of God yes. and in that land the Lord we have all these promises that we have in the word of God today and so it's not a time for us to start not sowing into the kingdom of God. It's a time to increase our, our giving because there's all, all these promises in it. You know, a lot of the first thing that we we think of, oh my God, there's a shortage. Oh my God, I don't have a job. Oh my God. And we tend to hold on really tight. But it's a time to release and, and not concentrate so much on your paycheck, what you see in front of you. God has, if you're out of a job, God has a job for you. A perfect job is going to suit you. And if we sow into the land of God, into the kingdom of God, he promises that we would prosper. He promises he's not going to let you go hungry, and, and he's going to provide for you, because he ultimately, God is our provider. Amen? Amen. So I just disregarded all those emails because I didn't want to get into debt with the government, especially because we're unsure of everything that's going on. But I want to keep my trust on the Lord because we've been through highs and lows and the Lord has never left us. He's never forsaken us. And that's what his word says. Yes. And he will never leave us or forsake us. So don't be sad. Be happy that the Lord's in control of our lives because we have given our lives to him. Amen? Amen. So we thank the Lord for that. So prepare your tithes and offering. You can give online at bclawcard.com. And, or if you want to mail it in, some people are mailing them in, and it, it's at P.O. Box 1399, Lockhart, Texas, 78644. Amen? So prepare that, and I will pray over it. Wherever you are in your homes, you can hold up your tithes to the Lord and, and, and offerings, and, and I, we'll just bless that, and the Lord is going to provide for you. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning, Father, for your goodness. You're so good to us, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to depend on, on our paychecks, Father, to, to be provided for. Your promises and your word says that you will, you will provide for us, Father. That we are your sons and daughters, and the Father will always provide for his sons and daughters. And Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are uh, preparing their tithes and their offerings. Lord, I pray that you would bless them, Father, that you would multiply it back to them, Father, that, Lord, they would be blessed in their jobs, Lord, that they they would, and if they've lost their job, Lord, we pray that they would find one quick, speedily, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We come with a give, grateful heart. We give unto your kingdom with a grateful heart. We honor you with our tithes and offerings. And Lord, and I just pray blessing over all the tithes and offering that are being sent in. And we sow it into your kingdom, Lord. We sow into this ground, Lord. Here at Vision Church, it's good ground, Lord. And we sow into it, Father. And we look to other ministries to sow into, Father. Because you're, it's, a, it's a promise, Lord. If we sow, we shall reap, Father. So we thank you, Lord, that none of the ministries around, none of the churches around us, Lord, will be uh, lacking anything. Yes. Father, that if you are watching us and that you're um, not a part of this uh, congregation, I pray that you would give into your, wherever you um, go to church, wherever you get fed, that's what you should be given. Amen? Amen. So we thank you, Lord, for what's being given into this ministry. Father, help us, the stewards, us to steward over it, Father, the way you want us to steward and I thank you and I bless it and, I, and we honor you with it this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Sister Sanders next.
So always go back. You know, sometimes you can look back at a message or a word that was given and, and you want to refresh your memory about what was said. You can always go back on Facebook or, or YouTube and, and visit those websites. And we would love to have you do that. And also just remember that we're continuing our Wednesday night services at 7. And now the English and the Spanish are doing lessons from David too. So we hope you are enjoying, enjoying them and the classes and that you're having a great time and learning a lot. Once again, we miss you and y'all have a blessed day. minister to everyone watching right now in Jesus name I rebuke the spirit of fear the spirit of worry the spirit of anxiety in Jesus name we thank you Father God that your angels are upholding your people your angels are protecting your people in Jesus name we thank you Father God that uh, this world that Satan cannot curse what you have blessed and we thank you, Father God, that your people are blessed. We are the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. In Jesus' name. You told us long ago, Lord, in Deuteronomy, to choose life or to choose death. Well, Father God, we thank you that we have chosen life. And we thank you that Jesus Christ does not give us just what we need, but he gives us life and life more abundantly. In Jesus' name. So we thank you, Lord, for an abundance of peace. We thank you for an abundance of finances. In Jesus' name, we call it in by faith. Yeah. We thank you, Father God, for an abundance of everything that we have need of so that it may overflow in our spirits, God. We may pour out into others by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> All right, so the title of today's message is Hope That Endures. Hope That Endures. And uh, man, I don't know about you, but we need some hope in this day and age, amen? There's a lot of people out there, even if you have hope and you're feeling good, there's a lot of people that, uh, that need that hope, amen? That hope that is an anchor for our soul, praise the Lord. So let's, let's go over here to Jeremiah 29, and uh, excuse me, in verse 11. Jeremiah 29 11. And it says here, For I know thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Amen. So I want to focus on really on verse 11 there. God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I kind of want to break this verse down um, for us to understand what this means when God says he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards. Some of you might think, well, of course he does. It's his thoughts. Of course he knows them. But the word thoughts there, it, it entails so much more than just a random thought. And um, when you look at the Hebrew for uh, where they get the word thoughts there, it's, um, it, it, it translates into a contrivance contrivance. And a contrivance means um, a thing which is created skillfully and inventively to serve a particular purpose. Okay, let me say that again. A thing which is created skillfully and intentively to serve a particular purpose. So we see that this is more than just a random thought. This, there's, a, there's a lot of work, God says, that goes into this. So when, when God thinks about your life, he says, the thoughts of peace, thought of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, so thoughts of, uh, when you look at the Hebrew for the word peace, safety. Okay, thoughts of safety. When God thought about you, God thought about safety in your life. Um, he says, not of evil, and that just essentially means bad when you translate it from the, from the Hebrew word there. Uh, not, 
not of bad things, nothing bad towards you. God is not thinking of anything bad towards you at all to give you a future and a hope. Amen? All of us want to know that we have a future. All of us want to know that we're here for a reason, we're here for a purpose, and it's more than to just, you know, suck up oxygen, right? Uh, God has a future for us. Amen? An expected end for us. So let's go over here to Psalm 139, and we're going we're gonna to break this down more. Psalm 139, verse 13. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. So I want us to get... I'm trying to fix my microphone here. Okay. Psalm 139 and verse 13. And, and this is... I, I, still, this is in relation to... Um, this is in relation to uh, Jeremiah that we just read there. Okay, Psalm 139 verse 13. For you... God formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Okay, so God didn't just slap you together, right? You see a kindergarten's drawing, it's usually stick fingers. That's not how God created you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Picasso has nothing on God when he made you. The detail that he put into your life. In verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Notice he says skillfully wrought in the, in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So we see that you have a purpose. The purpose was in you from the moment of conception. Amen. And that's why, you know, uh, as, as Christians who believe in God and we believe in the Bible, we're against abortion for this reason. Is that even though science and man may say that, oh, you know, there's really nothing there. We believe differently because we believe that everyone, every single person has been skillfully made. Amen? Amen? And that they have a purpose from the moment of conception. Praise God. Amen. Okay, so verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Amen. I think that's an awesome sentiment there that God's thoughts to us are precious. They're precious. Um, we need to understand how much we mean to God. Amen. We're, you know, we're not just, God doesn't just view us as bodies to use for his own pleasure on this earth. You know, God, um, he loves us. And he's, he's, we see here the skill that it took for him to make us, and not just physically, but on the inside, with a purpose, with a calling, with a destiny. Amen? God is invested in you. God invested in you before you were anything. And I think that just shows how much God thinks of us. Amen? Yeah. You know, just talk business-wise, right? If you're an investor and you're wanting to invest in something, you want to know that that thing is going to, you know, have a future. It's going to take off and it's going to, uh, it's going to excel. Well, God invested in you, you know, before he saw anything worth investing in. Praise God. God didn't invest in you because you were worthy of his investment. God invested in you because of his unconditional love for you. And that's what unconditional love is. is there's, there's nothing on the outside to make God love you. And God loved you when you were nothing. When you couldn't do anything. When you couldn't even think. God loved you and invested in your life. Amen. 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 Every person has a purpose. It doesn't mean every person fulfills their purpose. And it says all... 
that, that um, in God's book, all the days were fashioned for us. It doesn't mean that we, you know, and we'll talk about this in a second, but it doesn't mean that we always follow God's will or fulfill the purpose that he's placed within us. But nevertheless, it is there in every single human being on this earth. And then it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter, you know, if you, if, if you feel like you're limited because you have a, a, a disability or, you know, anything like that. You have a purpose from God. Amen? God has a purpose for you. Praise the Lord. Let's go over here to Jeremiah 1.5. <clears throat> Jeremiah 1.5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, this is God talking to Jeremiah, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So God knew us before we were even being formed in the womb. God knew you, and God knows you now better than anyone does. You know, that's why in my life, you know, sometimes in life you're just going to feel misunderstood. Even by your spouse, even by those close to you, you're going to feel misunderstood. But God, who skillfully... Uh, made you, amen, in the lowest parts of the earth, God who skillfully made you, he knows everything about you, amen, he knows your habits, he knows your desires, he knows everything about you, <clears throat> excuse me, and so you can always trust in him, praise the Lord, let's go to Isaiah uh, 44, 24, do we have that one, Isaiah, it's okay if we don't, Okay, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. So God says, I formed you in the womb. He says, I have made all things. Amen? Yeah. And God really, when you go back to Genesis, God made all things for our pleasure. Uh, but, you know, Adam's sin, it um, really corrupted things and tainted the perfect creation of God. But nevertheless, um, the earth we live in today is still beautiful. Amen. And God made all things. Now, <coughs> I want to describe, I want to put out a couple of, <laughs> a couple facts here. And this just helps us to understand how awesome God is when he formed us in the womb. Is that it takes... Uh, six months in the womb before the cortex uh, starts being formed. And the cortex is the center of your consciousness. Okay? So it takes six months uh, before the cortex um, uh, starts being formed. Okay? Uh, between week five and six, um, you, you will have your first electrical brain activity. Uh, in the womb. Between weeks five and six, you'll have the first electrical brain activity occur. So, <laughs> this is awesome. Before you even thought or were able to think, God began to put to work all, listen to this, all of his infinite wisdom to specifically plan your life with minute detail. Hallelujah. A lot of the things that we're worried about in life, we really should not be worried about. Because if we believe what the Bible says here from Jeremiah 29, 11, that when God thought or <coughs> contrived our life, he says, there are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So God spent, before you were even able to think <laughs> or do anything, God skillfully put all of his infinite wisdom to work to ensure your peace, your safety, to ensure that nothing bad would come upon you, to ensure that you would have a future and a hope. God spent a lot of, 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 of time, and I don't know if I should say time, but he spent a lot of effort and energy and skill making you in your mother's womb. Praise the Lord. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, I've experienced plenty of harm in life. But listen, 
any harm that we've experienced has been outside of, of, of the will of God. Of course, there's the exception of persecution that we see in the Word of God. But even through the persecution, we see with Jesus that, that God protected Jesus. There are many times when the religious people wanted to stone Jesus. And he was being persecuted. He was being lied about. But God protected him until it was his time to be the savior of the world and to sacrifice himself for us. And I'm telling you, that's not God's will for anybody else. God doesn't want anybody else to sacrifice themselves and to do what Jesus did and go through what Jesus did for, uh, for the sins of the world. Amen. Jesus already accomplished that, praise God. And so there is persecution that you will go through, but even in the midst of that persecution that Satan will bring against you, God has, has skillfully planned your safety, your protection. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22. Proverbs 8, 22. Thank you, Lord. It says here, this is talking about uh, this is talking about wisdom here in Proverbs chapter eight, and I want us to understand when we read there in Isaiah that God makes all things. I want us to understand exactly uh, what wisdom, the part that it played in our creation and the making up of who we are. So Proverbs 8, 22, the Lord possessed me, wisdom, at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I have been established from everlasting. From the beginning, before there was ever an earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains, abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields, or the primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, as a master craftsman, as a master craftsman, and I was his, uh, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. Amen. So this is wisdom talking here, saying that he was, that wisdom was with God in the beginning when he made. Everything, And I'll tell you that wisdom was with God when he made you. When he was skillfully planning your life. We need to understand how valuable we are if we are ever to fulfill the purpose that God put us on this earth to fulfill. Amen? You're not just here to work a 9 to 5 job and to make money. Although we need that. <laughs> but that is not your purpose, though. That's one of the things that you do, but that's not your purpose. And the reason why a lot of Americans are feeling unfulfilled is because they're putting their purpose in the wrong thing. They're putting their purpose in whatever makes them money. And that is not your purpose in this life. God has so much more for you. We need to work. We need to make money. But that is not your purpose. And so if we'll learn what our purpose is, that'll spark and ignite that hope, that fire of hope within us that will keep us going in this life. The reason why people faint and fall off to the side and, and give up is because they lose that hope. And I believe we lose that hope because we lose that purpose that God created us with. Amen? Hold on to that purpose. Jesus was a, a, a great man of purpose. You know, when, when his mother Mary came to him and said, all the wine at the, at the party is gone, at the wedding party is gone, and Jesus said, woman, it's not my time yet. And then Jesus knew he had a purpose. Praise God. And he knew that that purpose 
had, had, a, had a time frame for him. And so I want you to know <clears throat> that you were created with a purpose on this earth. Amen? Um, we, let's go to 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Praise the Lord. So <clears throat> if wisdom was with God and he made everything, including you, and he skillfully made you, it's, it's interesting here. God puts wisdom to shame with foolishness, so imagine what he can do with wisdom. God does great things with foolishness. He can put wisdom to shame with foolishness. So imagine what he can do with wisdom. Wisdom was with God when he made you. You're not dumb. You're, you're, you're not some, you know, ignoramus <laughs> who, who, you know, is, is going nowhere. You're not just a tumbleweed, just blown wherever. God has a purpose for your life. And the Bible describes in the New Testament that, that that hope is an anchor for our soul. The reason why you're just flying around everywhere and you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it is because you need hope in your life. God created you with that. That sense of a future, that sense of hope, that sense of safety. When God made you, he says, my thoughts towards you are this, safety, peace, not, not of anything bad to give you a future and a hope. God contrived that, which essentially means that he created, he, um, a, a contrivance is a, a thing which is created skillfully and inventively to serve a particular purpose. That is you. That is you. God, when he created you, he used wisdom and he used creativity to make you and to bring you forth in the, into this earth. It doesn't matter who your parents are. Your parents didn't make you. They were just a part of the process. <laughs> They were just the physical part of the process. But really, your parents didn't put inside of you the personality you have. Amen? Your, your parents didn't put inside of you the desires that you have. God put all of that inside of you. God is the one who made you. And your parents were just a part of that physically. Amen? So, praise the Lord. Do not give up hope. You have a future and a hope. And God skillfully and inventively created you to know that you have a future and a hope. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go to Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so we see in, in Psalm 139 that the, the days were fashioned for us in God's book. I think that's awesome that God has a book about our life. That should also tell you how much God thinks about it. Amen? God has a book about your life. Um, but we must understand, it says here, in order to prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, in other words, the book where all our days are fashioned for us, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? You know, it's possible to love God and not live a completely surrendered life to Him. There's a lot of Christians who, who love God, but their lives are not completely surrendered to Him. They're, they're still being conformed to the world, um, even if just a little bit. And, you know, I personally, I, I think all of us are a little bit conformed to the world, and, and we need to check ourselves in this area and, um, and make sure that, you know, we're being continually transformed by the renewing of our minds. Anybody who claims that, oh, I have nothing to do with the world and I'm completely transformed, um, you know, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Uh, because all of us are striving towards that uh, perfection and excellence that Jesus um, left for us to imitate in his life. Amen? Like in Ephesians 5.1, he says, be imitators, praise God, of, of our Father in heaven. So, but nevertheless, we need to check ourselves and say, am I being, we're all changing. All of us are changing. 
all the time. And we need to ask ourselves, okay, am I being more conformed to the world or am I being transformed by the renewing of my mind? Amen? And that really determines whether you're going to walk in the days that God has fashioned for you in his book to prove his good and acceptable and perfect will. So, in other words, even though God put all this skill and creativity and invention into your life to plan for your peace and your safety and, and, and your future, we, we must understand that hope is not an automatic thing. Amen? Hope is not an automatic thing. Let's go to Proverbs 13, 12. It says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Praise the Lord. All of you experience this, you know, especially on Christmas time. Maybe, you know, as a child growing up that, you know, when, when Christmas time comes, you have a certain expectation about what gift you want to receive. And uh, when you open up that gift, if it's what you want, man, the desire comes, the tree of life. You're excited. You're running around the living room. Praise God. You got what you want. You got a PlayStation or you got an Xbox or, you know, you got the toy you wanted, whatever it was. You got what you wanted. But if you open your gifts and you don't get what you put on your, on your gift list or, you know, if, if it's not what you expected, you know, if, if you're a good kid, you might try to hide your countenance. But really, on the inside, your heart is sick. Amen? And that's exactly what he's talking about here. See, hope, it simply means an expectation. Expectation. And something that is deferred, it simply means to be postponed. Postponed. So, in other words, when things don't happen how you want, uh, when you want, your heart will become sick, is what the Bible says. And, <coughs> excuse me, and going back to hope and our our calling and God's will for our life. I believe there are many who have missed out on God's best for them due to not following God wholeheartedly and, and many hearts were made sick um, as a result of that. Praise the Lord. In other words, we're not being transformed by the renewing of our minds and so we experience something that God didn't plan for us that wasn't God's will and, and uh, God still loves you but listen, if you're not following God wholeheartedly, you are not going to fulfill his will. You are not going to fulfill that purpose on the inside. And that's why people who are trying to lead a life without God, that's why they're, they're hopeless. You know, they may look all fancy and, and nice in the cameras and stuff and, and on Facebook, you know, smiling and, and everything. But I'll tell you, inside, when the cameras are off, when no one's looking at them, they're dead inside. They're, they're longing for something more in life. Praise God. And so, truly, the best way to live is to follow God with all of your heart. Because, again, God skillfully made you. He put those desires in you. Whatever those desires are, whether they're for business or whether they're to help people in a certain area, whatever God put inside of you, that's a desire that came uh, from Him to do good. Amen? But, you know, again, there's many who have missed out on God's best for them because they haven't followed God wholeheartedly. They're not being transformed by the renewing of their minds, and therefore they lose sight of that future and that hope that God created them with. Amen? And they get out into dangerous waters, and they get out from under the hand of the Lord, and their peace and their safety is no longer, you know, guaranteed for them, because, not because God doesn't love them, but because they refuse to do things God's way, and to follow Him, and to choose life. Amen? So, Praise the Lord. You know, in Romans chapter 1, he says, let me actually take us over there. In Romans chapter 1. And um, God essentially says here, if you want to live a life of sin and follow your own way, that's up to you. But it says here in uh, uh, Romans 1 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Right? So, uh, it says, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, and deceit. I mean, who wants to live like that? It's just like, <clears throat> you know, I know this is a sensitive topic, but I, um, I kind of heard yesterday there, there was a, a shooting in, in San Marcos. And, and this is why these things happen, is because 
people who reject God, as God says here, God says he allows them to do, uh, to, you know, if you're not being filled with God, what, are you, what is there to be filled with? You know, all good things come from him. If, if you don't choose, if you reject God, all that's left for you is envy and deceit and lies. And that's why these people do these horrendous acts is because they're full of these evil things because they've rejected God. And it's sad because, you know, they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to handle it because, um, because they're empty inside and they don't feel like they have a future. They have a hope. And that's why they're just willing to just throw their life away. Because they don't feel like they have a purpose or a future or hope. Amen? But I'll tell you, that's where the sons of light come into play. That's where the Christians rise up and say, you know what? God does have a purpose for your life. Amen? God used me to reach many people in my high school. I remember this one gentleman in particular. He was this big old guy. And, you know, his, he looked like he was in a gang and stuff. And, and anyways, you know, here I was, this little white kid, and uh, I had these little, these little booklets. Um, and on the front, it was, it was kind of cheesy, but on the front, it was a smiley face, and it said, smile, Jesus loves you. And I, and I went up and I gave it to him, and you, wanna, you know what his response was? His response, like, he, he told me, he said, man, God could have loved me. God could have loved me. And it just broke my heart that he said that, because people... Yeah, even young, young people, adults, they're missing out on God's best for them. They don't know that they were skillfully and creatively made in their mother's womb. They don't know that. They don't know that God loved them before they were able to think. They don't know that. They think that God's rejected them. They think that God is no longer holding out his hand in mercy for them because of what they've done or what they're doing. And as Christians, we've got to be better than that. We were called to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. We're called to be the light of the world. And too many Christians are hiding their light. Amen? It doesn't matter if you're a high school student or a middle school student. Praise God, or an elementary school student. You can shine your light wherever you are. It doesn't matter if your job doesn't allow you to talk about Jesus. You can still be a light. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We need to be we need to stop looking for excuses to hide our light, and we need to start looking and asking God for opportunities to shine our light. Praise the Lord, because this world, it needs hope. Amen? I know it needs hope now for sure, but even when this coronavirus thing is all done and over with, the world still needs hope. Praise God. Okay, let's go over here to Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Romans 8 and verse 18. I love this here. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains until, together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and to those who are called, who are the called, according to his purpose. Amen? Amen. So, I want to kind of break this little section down a little bit. And, and, um, but essentially, we understand he's talking about the next life here. He's talking about uh, hope, and he's talking about 
the next life after this life here on earth. And he talks about the revealing of the sons of God. And uh, we're not going to go there, but starting in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 36, we see the parable of the wheat and the tares, right? How Jesus essentially says that the angels will take all evil, including people who have subjected themselves to evil and rejected Christ. Um, that the angels will take all evil and dispose of it, and the people of God will shine forth. Um, uh, and we see in 1 Corinthians chapter um, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 15 about we, we see there about the, the new glorified bodies, right? How mortality will be swallowed up by immortality and corruption will be swallowed up by, uh, by incorruption. And so we understand that he's talking about the next life, how the sons of God will be revealed, um, will shine forth because God is going to take away all the evil and the sin and everything and dispose of it. And, um, and we understand here where it says in verse 22, in Romans 8, 22, that this time is near. This time is near um, for all of this to take place. In other words, labor is setting in and the, the birth is about to take place. This thing is about to take place. So um, essentially what he's telling us is we need to hold on to the hope because the things that we suffer in this present world, he says they're not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay? So he talks about our hope in verse 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? So, in other words, we can't see the labor pains going on. I mean, maybe we can a little bit when we see, you know, different viruses and famines, uh, famines and different things like that going on. We can kind of see some of those labor you know, pains, but a lot of people have, have closed their eyes to that. But as Christians, we must understand we're not a son of this world, we're a son of, we're a son of God. Amen? That's not a gender-specific term, but we're a son of God, we're a son of the light. And he says, hold on to this hope of what is to come. Praise God. We have a purpose here on earth, but let's also hold on to this hope of what is to come. Praise the Lord. And he tells us, in um, uh, verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So even though we don't see anything, we don't see the angels or anything, we don't see heaven getting ready to send the angels to come and, and throw the tears away and keep the weed. We don't see any of that, right? But he says we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So we're going to need some perseverance. We're going to have to endure through some things. And what's going to get you through the tough times and the sufferings is that hope of what is to come. So praise God for the hope, the purpose that God created us for here on earth. But there is also a hope that is uh, to come. Amen. Amen. And we need to be persevering and pushing through uh, the things that we, you know, have to deal with on this on this earth that is that is corrupted. Amen. Praise God until God comes and makes everything right. But in the meantime, he says, don't be moved by what you see, because hope is not according to what you see. If you see it, it's no longer hope. It's no longer expected. It's, it is, right? So don't be moved by what you see. And then he tells us in verse 26 that the Holy Spirit will help you in your weaknesses. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all together. I don't think any of us are 100% in faith all the time, you know? But the Holy Spirit will help you in your weaknesses. And God tells us, he says, listen, in Corinthians, I won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he will make a way of escape for you. Praise God. So in other words, you know, there will never be something in front of you, an obstacle. Or, or, some, or there, God will never allow Satan to tempt you to a point that you're not able to resist him. God will always make sure that you are able to resist the enemy and to follow God and take the way of escape that God has made for you in the midst of that temptation. Because temptation doesn't come from God, as we see in James. Amen. But God makes the way of escape. The escape comes from God. Praise the Lord. God says, submit to me, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, um, <clears throat> praise God. So we're responsible for our life and the way our life goes. And, and fulfilling the purpose that God made us for. 
Amen? But the Spirit will help you in your weaknesses. And I'll tell you, we need to be relying on the Holy Spirit more than we are now. We need to be looking to Him. He's the Spirit of truth. He will lead us and guide us into all truth. We need to be looking to the Spirit more than ever. Praise God. Because He is the one who helps us in our weaknesses. A lot of Christians are crumbling over their weaknesses. And, and they're looking for help. Well, I'll tell you, the help is right here. The Holy Spirit will help you. He is your helper. That is the reason why He was sent to this earth by Jesus to, to dwell in you. Amen? Thank you, Lord. He wants to help you in your weaknesses. Praise God. Let's go over here to um, 2 Corinthians 12.10. 2 Corinthians 12.10. This, uh, this is Paul speaking here. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses. Uh, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of weaknesses right there, right? He says, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, Paul's saying, man, I have all these weaknesses and these things I go through where I don't feel strong, I don't feel mighty, I don't feel like a great man or woman of, of, of God or of faith. But Paul says, it's when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When you rely on the grace of God is what he's talking about in the context there. The grace of God, the Spirit of God helps you according to the grace of God. Amen? And uh, let's go to Mark 9, 24. I love this here. And Jesus' interaction, the disciples could not handle this man's boy. And so Jesus came and said, you know, man said, Jesus, if you can do anything, help me. Heal my son. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And this is the man's response. He's crying out with his weaknesses. He said, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay? So that was the man saying, Lord, I believe, but I also have weaknesses. And we see that the boy of this man was healed. Amen? The Spirit is there to help you in your weaknesses. Not that it's not that we justify unbelief or justify, you know, any, any of, of those worldly things. <clears throat> but God is there to help you in your weaknesses. Praise God. When Peter began to, to, to you know, essentially drown in the ocean, in the sea, uh, Jesus didn't say, well, you didn't have faith. Too bad. You know, you got, you got distracted by the wind and the waves. No, Jesus grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. Praise God. <clears throat> the Spirit is there to help you in your weaknesses. But you've got to look to him. Amen. Because Jesus is no longer physically on this earth to help you. Praise God. But you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you. And he is just as able. Because he intercedes for you according to the will of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is just as interested um, in your calling, in your purpose, in your well-being. As the Father is. Praise the Lord. But we don't emphasize the Holy Spirit probably as much as we should. Amen. So essentially what he's saying here in Romans 8.28. When he says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. And those who are called according to his purpose. What he's saying is. As long as you hold on to hope. Amen. Remember we were talking about the context there. As long as you hold on to hope. God will see to it. That all things work together for you. As long as you hold on to that hope. Praise God. Don't forget who your maker is. Love God. Don't forget who gave you your purpose. Amen? We're called according to His purpose. Not according to what I want to do. Amen? But God knows me and knows you better than anyone. And so if you will follow His purpose, you will live a much more fulfilled life than you ever could on your own. And trying to make your own desires come to pass. Praise God. And so, as long as you hold on to hope, God will see to it that all things work together for you. Let's go to 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5.10. <clears throat> Let's read that together. 1 Peter 5.10. I don't think I put that one in there, did I? <laughs> Let me go over there. 1 Peter 5.10. Yeah, I got it. But may the God of all grace, hallelujah, whatever you need, God has the grace for it, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That is God's promise to us. Amen? The Bible tells us, uh, believe to the end. Praise God. He who endures to the end shall be saved, is what the Bible says. And brothers and sisters, Satan will try so many different ways to discourage you and to get you to become weak and faint and to drift off to the side. But God says, hold on to this hope. Amen? 
and your latter will be better than your beginning. Praise God. I love that God never gives up on us, but he's there to help us on the journey. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, and verse 16, and we'll end it here. Romans 4, 16. Okay, this is talking about Abraham here. <clears throat> Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So Abraham, we are the seed of Abraham. If you believed in Christ, you, you are the seed of Abraham because Abraham is the father of faith. Um, verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. That sounds like hope to me, right? In verse 18, who contrary to hope and hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So there was nothing on the outside to give, um, to give, you know, God hope or Abraham hope about Abraham having many descendants, but they didn't lose faith. They didn't lose hope. In verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Amen? So we see that faith will strengthen you. Well, faith in what? When you believe in the promises of God, when you believe that God doesn't just talk the talk, but that God is faithful to perform his word, when you believe that, you will be strengthened. Amen? In yeah. verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him. For righteousness. Praise the Lord. So we see there the importance of hope, how Abraham, the, the way that he endured through that, that dry spell, so to speak, of when God gave him that promise, you know, that he'll be the father of many nations, and you know, it didn't look like anything was going to happen, but Abraham endured, and he strengthened himself. And I want to encourage you to strengthen yourself with the promises of God, because God is faithful. In your life, and he wants to prove his faithfulness to you. Amen. He has not abandoned you, he has not forsaken you, he has not forgotten you. God loves you, and he still has a future and a hope for you today. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for everyone watching. I thank you for everyone listening, God. I pray, Lord, that they would be encouraged, they would be strengthened, knowing that you love them and you created them. With a mighty, mighty purpose, God. You didn't just randomly think their life into existence, God. You skillfully and inventively created them. So, Father God, I pray that we would not forget who we are. That we are your children. And that we would not forget where we're going, God. We would not forget the life that is to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If you don't know Jesus, I'll tell you, now is the time to get right with God. Now is the time to believe on Christ. Just we're, like we're talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares. Amen. You don't want to reject Christ. Praise God. You don't want to reject God. Because all that's left for you is covetousness and anger and bitterness. And God wants you to be healed and set free. He sent his son to save the brokenhearted. Amen. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I want you to receive Christ in your life. Receive the life and life more abundantly that Christ came to give you. Because he loves you. He's paid the price. All that's left is for you to respond and say, yes, Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray this after me. Say, Father God, I love you because you first loved me. I surrender my life to you. I've heard about you, but now I believe in you. I surrender to you, I repent of all my sins, and I receive your Son as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you pray that prayer of faith, we believe that you are born again, you are brand new, a new creation is what Corinthians says, 
and we're excited for you. We're excited for all that God has for you. This is the beginning of your adventure. Um, if you gave your life to Christ, I want you to go ahead and, um, you know, comment or message the church. And we just got a, a little book that we would love to, to send you to be a blessing to you to help you in your journey following Christ. Amen? All right. We love y'all. God bless y'all. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday night at 7 p.m.